mine. Huh? <laughs> no, but don't answer that. Oh, how was Christmas, Joe? Tell me about your holiday with your. I know you said it wasn't as big, of course, as it was going to be. How was your holiday with your family? Uh, it was. It was pretty exhausting. There was. Uh, I mean, well, the initial, the direct family holiday was phenomenal, and then, but then we went down to Nashville to visit all of the extended family, and that was just kind of a wreck. Why? So, um, there was. So, were you there during the bombing? We were there the day after, so Christmas uh, morning was the bombing, and then we went down the next day because we wanted to catch a catch a gander of that. And the only person that was injured was the bomber himself. That's true. Yeah. Okay. Good. That's well. I guess that's a blessing. Just so such a sad, crazy story. And then I saw. And then you texted me that you were down there. I was like, whoa. So yes, yeah, so you went down the twenty sixth for Boxing Day. Yeah. And there was a lot of, but I was going to say there was a lot of miscommunication with my family. There was uh, a part of our family that wanted to, that we had already planned to see. And then there was another part of the family that we, that told us they didn't want to see us. And then when we got down there, they said they did want to see us and they were upset with the amount of time they got to see us. And yeah, well, it's impossible right now. You know what is. I mean? It's so hard with the I agree. the back and forth and the, the COVID stuff. I mean, you know, I probably saw more people for the holiday than I wanted to as far as COVID is concerned, but nowhere near the number of people I normally see uh, for the holiday. So um, how was yours? Great. Really lovely, really lovely small get together with my grandmother and my mom. Got to see my parents, my brother and my grandmother and my in-laws all separately and sometimes masked in some cases because there was a COVID scare at Clay's uh, uh, work, I think, or something. And uh, I see, you know, but he got tested Christmas morning, I think, or Christmas Eve morning and uh, negative. And then uh, I think he's got tested again. He got his results back on Christmas morning. No, he he got tested and had a rapid test uh, oh, Christmas fun. Eve. Oh, cool. And so he got the results, the negative results that morning. He was uh, happy about that. And so we were able to see each other, and it was great. Cool. Um, so we, I, I put this in here because I mean to talk about this. So uh, the theme to Baywatch was a song called I'm Always Here by Jimmy Jameson. Uh, it was on his album Empires, which had like the Statue of Liberty, like, on a galaxy, like, in an eagle, like, that was also a mountain. Like, the cover was great. And I think my old band, Too Deep, is currently working on an interpretation of that that we want to put out. I don't know how long it's going to take or what um, uh, for what it will be. We're talking about maybe doing it for charity or something. But where uh, the drums are being tracked as we speak. So that'll be on the way. I have a bass player lined up. I think I'm going to ask Kim to sing it. So Too Deep is uh, coming back. That's great. Too Deep is back. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. Um we kind of have the technology now to do a lot of the recording remotely. So sending each other the pieces until it's all finished, um, which is great. Um, Joe, what's up with the, the Spotify Rogan thing? So here's the thing I had you look into a little bit. Um, and when I say Spotify Rogan thing, I'm talking about a very specific part of his transition to, yeah, um, to Spotify. It's really just cause it's a, it's a issue I was curious about. So for example, like episodes with people like Alex Jones and Milo Yiannopoulos are missing. And uh, originally we heard that employees at Spotify were protesting in some way, but I didn't know if that was still going on. And then we were having a conversation about, you know, like Twitter, for example, is classified as a public domain location or something. So if Spotify was like that, um, It'd be a different story than if they paid, if they own all that content. Right. You it's, know what I mean? Yeah. And I think, you know, we were kind of just talking about the frustration with, you know, just, I guess, the lack of explanation and the censoring. Um, but I think <clears throat> the only, like, valuable article I found on it was from Variety. Uh -huh. Like, nobody has really touched on it. Well, because it's kind of a stupid thing to be news, right? We're yeah. talking about. But here's my thing is those are some crazy conversations that happen. Those are some extreme characters that have been on that show yeah. that uh, that are now being I th love seeing how ridiculous some of those people are. Yeah. So I don't think acting like they don't exist is productive, but I just didn't know. Um, among other episodes not available on Spotify or Rogan's podcast with Chris D'Elia, um, since he was kind of uh, canceled for Instagramming or DMing underage uh women we're talk about that 
Uh, one with Tommy Chong from May of 2019, um, and two featuring both Joey Diaz and Brian Redband, who are, you know, I think Joey Diaz is uh, getting heat because he told some story about when back when he was a drug addict, they kidnapped somebody or something, and uh, which is terrible. But also part of his recovery process, I think, is is confronting all those crazy stories of just what his life was like before he got control over it. But um, yeah. And again, like, I think a lot of this stuff is available on YouTube. Right. But it's just not in the same thing. And we looked up an example. For example, uh, there's a Prince song called um, The Most Beautiful Girl in the World that's off the Gold Experience album. It's different, though. And it's totally a different situation. But, like, when we go to that album, all the songs are available to stream on Spotify except for that one song. It's listed there, but it's grayed out. Like, you can't click on it. Which I think is more appropriate and more honest. Well, and on the Rogan experience, for example, it goes from 1254 to 1256. Like, it skips episode 1255. which is If it doesn't exist. Which was really my... um, insight into alex jones and and his, the stuff that he is really out there promoting and how uh, sensational and kind of crazy so much of it is and um and i find it so entertaining even though i don't you know uh what's the word identify with him at all um ideologically you know what i mean so um let's see where this goes what do we have here i think it's more problematic um the nature or the way they've decided to go about without without and, and Joe Rogan hasn't really made a made a real pub he hasn't, he hasn't made a real public announcement about it. He hasn't really discussed it truly and fully. And I think and because it, it must still be in the works. <clears throat> right. But it, it it's like I think because Joe Rogan has a reputation of just going a little bit more full circle than a lot of people. I think he it's something that's important that he needs to address, even if he agrees with what Spotify has done. If he didn't like the interviews and he wants to take them down, that's fine. But at least let's let's hear it. Let's hear him say it. I feel like that's an honest thing to do as a show host. Well, and we do this on this show is that we are critical of podcasting is my favorite sort of art form right now that uh, when, the majority of my entertainment is podcasts. And I really love just the variety and the freedom and the, um, the long format. And even the ones that have a bunch of ads or it's just so much easier and more effective to get to what you're looking for in a way that you can also do other things on your phone. You know, if I could watch a YouTube video in the corner of my phone while I'm playing Pokemon go, I would do that. But there's, you know, the RIAA won't let us have that privilege for some reason. And um, a, an opinion that, yeah, that I want to clarify that I heard from someone was that it, it's the discussion about if Spotify, Spotify is not necessarily a public domain platform. So it's not like Facebook and it's not like Twitter. It's not something where people go to be a part of a news feed or a culture kind of, uh, kind of circus of thoughts. And I feel like, because of that, it's, it is, it, it's very much its own organization that can choose what it curates and doesn't curate yeah, like a record store. And yeah. which is why I think as, you know, promoting, you know, a free market, you know, they should technically be able to do that. If they if they don't want to sell that episode, they shouldn't have to. They shouldn't, you know, which I think we should be able to come to terms with. But I just wish it was addressed. Well, that's the thing. Just to explain it, and here's and and those videos are available other places now. The Alex Jones thing is one thing because you could just look at that as one guy that has his own independent news channel, and he can do and say whatever he wants, and he researches these really extravagant, over the top <laughs> um, things, and he makes these wild claims. And I popped in on him last night. And he was interviewing. Um, Kyle Rittenhouse's mother. So I'm like, yikes, brother. <laughs> that is not um, where I want to be. But let's get into the Milo thing. Like, Well, so and that's the thing. You and me looked into the, the Milo interview, and he says a lot of crazy stuff, not just to be crazy, but also stuff that is um, indicative of his ideology, which is a little alarming. Like, um, he seems to have some really weird... Um, issues with race and gender and um and power and right. authority and he's Is there a way we can play a little bit? I guess I'm we not shouldn't. doing that. That's right, we shouldn't. That makes sense. Right. Um, um but but also but just like so when he's and he also has a unique experience. He was um I think you said he said something about part of why he's not around anymore. We're talking about Milo Yiannopoulos. 
right. is um, he's a one, you know, I, I, I don't have a lot of tolerance for the English, so I'm trying to be polite. First off. Uh, but he's, a you know, an English um, gay journalist who's also, you know, kind of a, like an, almost like a white nationalist kind right. of a figure. And uh, he'll go on those rants, but I, I don't necessarily think he's as passionate about, I think he's had to be held accountable for those thoughts, but I don't think he's quite as passionate as he is about the idea. And that idea. was the, the Rogan episode 703 <clears throat> or whatever it was right. that he was on that we checked out this morning to see exactly why he's so problematic because I hadn't heard him talk in a long, long time. Yeah, I think the thing that got him cut off, and I think this is the reason why I might support it, is because he, he was a, he was uh, suggesting that people who are trans or people who identify a certain way, uh, there's no validity to it, and it's something that should be, it's part of an agenda, and it's part of, and because yeah, he, he said it's so... Yeah, he speaks about a lot of issues in a way that, he is a great example of how the white patriarchy kind of looks in the gay community, because just because you're a gay man like he is, does not mean that you're going to be um, and these Fox uh, News hosts play that card all the time. They're well, like, well, a, I'm an atheist, so I can talk about it. It's like, no, you can't. Sorry. But it, well, it's like you you're representing just what atheism looks like in the context of your privilege. You're exactly. free, Milo, to have a platform and to be a journalist on some of the most competitive platforms in the world. He's been on. He was. He worked for the Telegraph. He was on Breitbart, places that I don't necessarily subscribe to, but that they're the real news sources with real sponsors and it's a real um i don't want to say even news sources but they're real platforms right it's like a, he's not just some guy tweeting crazy stuff right People, he actually was employed to be one a, point to be a source of information right so here's his thing is or here's my thing with him is um it's just like my thing is i'm so pro um the transgender kind of equality uh uh discussion and and uh movements but um, Caitlyn Jenner is not the best example of uh that process when you have somebody. I, I mean, I think it's such a part of the conversation because it's something that wealthy white men took an interest in. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. If it was, if we were talking about <laughs> that's the terrible laugh. I'm working on it. So if we were talking about um other issues. You know, uh, they never get the attention that they really deserve until the ruling class gets there. Until there's right. a member of until there's a rich guy. Until there's a rich, <laughs> specifically a rich white guy that yeah. wants to. And he was seventy or something when that started taking place. And wait, um, Jenner, uh, no. Caitlyn Jenner, she was 70? at the time Bruce Jenner, and she was like in her seventies. No, well, I look it up. Look looking, that up, please. I guess, I guess I'm the guy. So it's also like. Caitlin didn't even have a platform to be removed from necessarily. Um, the money was made. It was in the bank. The freedom, um, the lip, the the liberty. <laughs> Late sixties. But um, oh, liberty. Um, Caitlyn Jenner is one hundred ninety-seven years old. Is what I'm trying to That's say. That's true. I'm looking at it. Um, but seventy-one. She's seventy. I just wish that we could have this meaningful conversation about these uh, issues of human rights and civil rights for all these different groups. Um, without waiting for rich white dudes to get there. Like, why Why do we have to wait for them? I know why. I know why. It's because they're in charge of everything, and it's unfortunate that it's disproportionate that way. Can I... Uh... Even though I have that privilege. That's the thing. I <laughs> yeah. have the privilege to have these conversations in a way that... Um, right. And to really have time alone to spend with these issues. Uh, so I, I acknowledge that's part of my privilege... Also, I just wish it didn't. Ha I wish we didn't have to wait for it um, to get there. So um, Milo's kind of, for me, kind of toxic like that. He's a great representation of how, um, you know, people try to have. And Candace Owens is another one. They try to say, oh, well, Candace Owens is a young black female journalist and uh, a young woman of color. I think she's my age. I almost said our age, but we're now not this the same is a age. different conversation. Jay. Well, no, but here's the thing. It's so Milo is is the gay guy and she's the black girl that both like give their groups a pass to be like, no, you. it's not hateful because look, we have this gay friend. We have this exactly. black friend. Exactly. So if she says um, something crazy, like the stuff that she says, right. Then it seems like it's harder to critique her because she's, she's not this established privileged class, mm -hmm. at least on the outside. Right. 
Um, so Milo's that same way, is that he can promote these kind of really toxic ideologies or, or suppressive ideologies about other members of the LGBT community because he really doesn't identify with them because he's still kind of, he has the privilege of being both. Here's the hot take with Candace Owens that I always say when she gets brought up, which is... Here we go. Which Here's the hot take, which is, I don't think it's any... It's nobody's right to say or make any statement about what African Americans do with their blackness and in if they use it as a platform or whatever. I didn't That's, even yeah. say that. Maybe we need to cut that. No, 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 but, no, no. I know what you're saying. But when it comes to Milo, I am going to have to say that I, I believe that he has used his um, sexuality to kind You almost of, said gayness. I didn't say it. You almost said I gayness. Didn't, I, He's going to use his gayness. Gayness. <laughs> He's got to, his gayness gene. <laughs> to, to kind of nudge his way into the conversation. And that's a great point, that maybe yeah. he got given, he was given more, <clears throat> uh, he got, he done got, he done got it. Mm -hmm. He was given maybe more of a platform to get to the point where he got in his career as a journalist, right. even in spite of some of his more toxic ideologies or some of his um, kind of ugly habits. Um, because maybe he was a, a <laughs> not his gayness because of his gayness. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's his gayness. No, so <laughs> but that's the thing too is because we're talking about um him. It's uh, it seems like it's okay. So, but and here's where this conversation went with him, and I think this is a bigger part of this problem. Um, uh, is part of his. Watch I almost said toxicology, this. but <laughs> part of his toxic kind of rhetoric that got him deplatformed, and the part of the reason probably why his episode of Rogan is not on Spotify is because he says crazy things about pedophilia and gender and all sorts of issues that are really sensitive. Specifically in the progressive community. He's suggesting Yeah, he about was suggesting pedophilia. in that clip that we watched <clears throat> that um that progressive liberals are um going to uh Give make pedi pedophilia um, a, an equal rights issue like that we need to advocate for the rights of pedophiles or something and which is and that that he feels like the trans movement is a slippery slope i hate when they use that argument right. um a which i think we should pick it apart right it's a slippery slope leading to he's saying that the trans movement is a slippery slope to the pedophile thing and we were talking about jeffrey epstein's thing was he would always tell people people you know that were that liked him that were close to him really regarded him as an intellectual and a smart guy and a visionary or something from what i've read and um he would tell them things like um one day pedophilia will be recognized as a, a sexual orientation instead of a disorder or a um, whatever, right? It's crazy, <laughs> but that was his vision as he thought. So here's my, here's my thing, and I would love to open a conversation about this with our listeners if people know anything about this, but from what I've read, and I'm pulling this from podcasts and articles and AP stuff, like I try not to just get into the weeds. I'm not reading... I'm not on ObamaWatcher.com or some of these crazy sites that people just throw up. I'm really interpreting this from the news that things that witnesses to his um, his whole experience um, have said these things. And that he really wanted, like NAMBLA, Joe, we were talking about the National Association of Man, Boy, Love and Love. Affection or whatever mm -hmm. they're called. Um are people that are saying that, no, I'm not a monster because I'm sexually attracted to underage citizens. I am just different than you. But here's my thing is I know for a fact it was on record in many of his court cases that Jeffrey Epstein was abused sexually as a child in some way. And that I think we can draw a correlation between his abuse that he experienced and his inclinations of pedophilia. And then he had this crazy sinister uh experience with uh developing and cultivating wealth and then was able to parlay that into this giant network of human trafficking and and uh and pedophilia like it sounds unreal it sounds like it doesn't even sound like a good movie when you when you really get into the details i think we have to find a balance between protecting underage individuals from uh, abuse of any kind but also having to um uh, teach those individuals, our kids, about their sexuality 
so that they know how to grow into uh, uh, healthy uh, uh, adults. Um, but we also have to start treating these people that feel like they are just genuinely attracted to children as a sexual entity. It's it's a it's not um, enough to just make those issues taboo, right? Because what Epstein really thought he was doing was pioneering his his own civil rights experience as a sexual orientation minority. Right. And that's the kind of danger that Milo was warning against, I think, in that clip. But he's also or in a horrible fashion. Yeah, but he's doing way. it in a really terrible way and probably yeah. for the wrong reasons. Right. Right. He's trying to suppress this <clears throat> mainstream uh, opening of this conversation about um, gender and sexual orientation that's been happening really since the Supreme Court made same sex marriage legal. We've been able to move to this place. He's trying to downplay that, which this, is a good thing. He's trying to down. He's trying to downplay this good thing that's happening. We're talking about stuff that's really important, and it's going to save people's lives. It's going to allow people to to grow up in a way that uh, and develop in a way that allows them to be their true selves, so they don't have to abuse drugs and alcohol and live in some kind of a an illusion or a lie all the time. It's a good thing that we're talking about all those things, right? Like we talked about. Is there a way it could go wrong? Well, hold on. Sorry, I'm sorry. No, 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 you're right. Um, <laughs> and But he's trying to take away all that good stuff and all that progress because he's saying, look, we're all going to be, um, eventually the these, this group is going to grow. This, you know, People like Epstein that want to be allowed to have relationships with underage people is going to grow, with children, is going to grow if we keep going down this slippery slope, is what he's saying. I think they're totally unrelated. Mm -hmm. But like you and me were talking about, and we wrote some of this down, is that um, we're, as a society, sending a lot of mixed signals. So we all agree that we need to protect underage um, uh, people, uh, children, people under the age of consent. We need to protect them from being abused or manipulated because we know that their brain development is such, your brain develops well into your 20s, apparently, they keep telling me. And... So it makes sense to have protections for people before they get to the point where they can make those decisions. I think like for financial situations and stuff like that, I mean, like that age could probably go up to 20 or 21. If you really want to talk about what let's not get ahead of ourselves. You know what I'm saying? But anyway, so <laughs> I'm just um, kidding. <laughs> we need to protect those people. We need to protect kids from being um, abused in any way, right. Or, or assaulted in any way. Certainly. Um, and we need to also not just act like their sexuality doesn't exist because then it will just emerge um, in a way that uh, is completely unchecked and unhealthy. And they're going to learn things from this vast library of ever growing millions of hours of high definition pornography. And they're going to learn from and how their friends exist? and they're going to maybe make mistakes that right. they can't fix um, because they didn't know better beforehand. So that's, as a society, we are agreeing that we want to do that, right? We want to teach kids how to be healthy and safe, and we also want to protect them while they're vulnerable as as young people. Um, but we're not doing. But we're not limiting. We're not. Li <laughs> we're not limiting the way that they can sexually exploit themselves on things like TikTok or you know. It used to be when I was a kid, they were saying, "Oh, they're all putting naked pictures on the MySpace," and we're not doing enough to. Um, to i don't even want to say block because you know prohibition is not the solution right uh by itself right but there's so many ways that young people can exploit themselves sexually maybe even unknowingly but like on tiktok on even the word discourage feels wrong because because it's such it's something that a lot of people you know, I have a girlfriend that dances. She dances, you know, and she's my actual girlfriend, a romantic. You know, she's an, uh, my partner. We all believe you. She and, went to a different school. You met her at Niagara Falls. Go yeah, ahead. And, and she's a dancer, and she has a big beef with this because <clears throat> it's such a fine line. Exactly. But with female, because dancing is such a important Female dance part. is exactly where we're going. This was a conversation earlier in the year about that documentary, Cuties, that was right. all about you know, the the dance group, but it was like a form of contemporary hip-hop dance that's really sexual or something. I didn't watch it, so I don't know. Mm. 
And they were part of the documentary was saying, we need to see, look how ridiculous this is. We should not be letting them do this. But also it was showing millions of people that had no idea. Hey, look what these girls are doing. Which so, I love that form of comedy. Sorry. Well, it's fun. That's funny. <laughs> it is funny because it's so like, guys, what are you doing? <laughs> right. But it's scary because it's like, okay, so yes, we're drawing. Yeah, we should probably stop this. We should probably transition um, dance instruction for young women away from these hypersexual forms of dance. It worked. And um do you mean the objective of the documentary to right. inhibit those things? Yeah, I don't well, think it was a documentary. It was a, it was a narrative. What? It was a, it was a whole work. Everybody thinks it's a documentary. It was a feature? It was it was a actors and fiction. It was a completely... I'm sorry. Oh, Jesus. See, yeah. I don't even know. I didn't watch it. So you misspelled balance on the show prep in a way that is ruining my life. I'm just going to go fix it. And Wait, that's not how you... Okay, Joe... Sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Literacy sorry. crisis in that's our country. Right. We'll get there. And so... Even if you're drawing attention to this issue, you're also creating fodder for this audience of malicious people who may be victims themselves. We were talking about Michael Jackson a minute ago. I think his childhood was so challenging and traumatic that he was stuck developmentally, socially or romantically or whatever, in a certain place mm -hmm. to where his sexual preference stayed at maybe the age that he was when those things happened to him. Right. And I'm, and, Everything he did is terrible, and I, I can't listen to a lot of his music anymore because of it, and it's um, really hard. It's a really hard issue for society to have to go through. It'd be like if Elvis, you know, murdered his whole family or something. <laughs> it's really like that. It's <laughs> it's really devastating. It'd be, it'd be like, you know, it's like um, watching Muhammad take a shit. Like, you don't want to have to go through that. <laughs> and so he was stuck there. And that does not excuse anything that he did as an adult, but nobody did anything to unstick him there. Even the most wealthy, famous people didn't have access or value in the mental health resources to correct that issue, right? I think Jeffrey Epstein was probably a pedophile because of what he experienced as a youth. And I, I think a healthier point. society could have treated that young victim and kept that young victim from becoming a malicious predator as an adult, but that's not what happened. Right. And so I think the reason Milo's rhetoric is sort of toxic is because it's not allowing the full conversation to take place. Part of the thing we hear about all the time, part of why I love podcasts is because they can be deeper like this is that all these things can be true at once. We have to, um, we have to discourage people from seeking out children as a um, a sexual interest, either online or in person, either way. We were just talking a couple months ago, a video came out of a guy I went to high school with who got outed by um, these young women who baited him uh, and outed him as a pedophile. It was crazy. What the text messages they released, I'm not going to mention his name, but it was absolutely wild. We absolutely need to keep discouraging um that pedophilia from from happening but we also need to start fixing where it comes from and start identifying all the different scenarios of how do we create um pedophiles in our society and then what are we going to do to to inhibit some of that creation and there are other explosions throughout history that you can look at in the 60s and 70s there was this huge explosion of uh molestation in schools in churches in um things like that alongside this huge movement. I've heard Dr. Drew talk about this because he was there. I wasn't there. I wasn't born yet. Alongside this huge movement in society of, Oh, uh, children are just young adults. They have interests and feelings and they have sexuality and you need to treat them like they're just miniature adults. It was, I guess, well-intended, but it really fed this fire of all these people that had grown up being constantly exposed to lead who then have who then have these traumatic experiences because nobody knows how to be a parent yet because it's you know um world war ii the greatest and then, well hold on and then um they're all in the workforce being told <laughs> kids are just little adults and then that's where all this molestation uh could have come from i'm not saying correlation is causation but i'm saying what i'm saying so as a society we have to discourage that pedophilia, figure out where it comes from and stop it. And 
continue to protect the freedom and safety of our youth, but maybe we need to also this third piece, maybe we need to start having conversations about what is okay and not okay um, for young people to show of themselves. That's the thing is that if you want to study dance because you have an affinity for dance, I want you to do that. I don't want anyone to use your participation in that activity as a, um, as a malicious sort of, uh, sexual uh, thing for them. Assumption or, of intention. Yeah. yeah, and that's and and that's the hard part. Is when you put out a TikTok, you're sh you're sharing it with your your friends and your your audience, but you're also leaving it open to um, that malicious part. But I'm also anti censorship, and I've said things on social media that people have taken issue with, and we've had conversations about those things and He's a very controversial person. And I do have, uh, I do have my limitations despite what some people in my family will tell you about things I post on social media. But, um, normal people know what balance I'm talking about. Right. But the problem is, as a society is like, um, Hey, everyone's on TikTok. download TikTok. Oh, it's a bunch of underage girls. Oh, don't you dare. Uh, express any positive um, reaction to that, you monster. Like, what do we like? It's and the problem is, it's not all coming from the same place, right? But we need to start to unify some of that messaging. I think, you know, just to go even farther in depth, I think, <clears throat> I think these people also need to recognize their. I think it is pedophilia a, a problem. I think it is. Mm -hmm. Um. Does should they be able to have their way with somebody whose brain maybe not is maybe not mature enough to make that decision, you know, responsibly? No, Cause that's shouldn't. the thing too. Because people always say, "Well, what if you're like a 14 year old kid and you have this 23 year old teacher that's super hot?" I'm like, one, this is all a gross hypothetical. Why are we doing gross hypotheticals? Yeah. But also, let's make it even worse. But also, if if that 14 year old, <laughs> that 14 year old kid can't go forward 10 years as a 24 year old man and say, Oh yeah, I was okay with that. You got to watch. And so future. he can't undo whatever he does, whatever freedom he has to do. Um, and this is part of the argument because people always say, Oh, well, you know, it's a double standard and maybe that's the case, but right. it's, it's just not okay. It's just but what not... I was, well, I'm sorry, Jake. No, you're right. What I was getting at is though, is that people still have to recognize that pedophilia is a problem. Right. Yeah, and so they have to be able to handle yeah. the ramifications for, and, and you should tell people. We shouldn't, I think that's the, you know, we the problem with Milo is that he's actually discouraging um, pedophiles from being open. We should be, they should be open. And we should be, and I'm not necessarily, and the problem is we're not making a safe space for them. That's what they think, is that we're, oh, we're going to make a safe space for them. We're not necessarily, because... What pedophiles have to understand is that we, what's going to happen is, is they're going to come out, and now the society is going to give them a, a road, and they're going to say, okay, we're going to look back into your childhood, we're going to look, you know, and we're going to give you the support you need. However, if you have a sister and she has kids, you're going to have to be okay with her maybe not being comfortable with That's her the being, thing. You know, we need to be able to treat adult individuals who feel like they are sexually attracted to children in a way that is restorative and healing of that issue. And part of that is also going to be that we're going to have to have some uncomfortable conversations, but it's hypocritical to say that there's no excuse for being attracted to anyone below a certain age when we're also exploiting that age group sexuality, like on the Disney channel and right. TikTok and these crazy threads on Pornhub. We were talking about all the oh, teen categories and college categories and, oh, she's barely legal and stuff that's just really really gross and it, it definitely has an audience because there's more and more of it all the time but it's like why is that a thing why as a society are we craving that much less allowing that but why is there an audience for that what is maybe unhealthy in the way that we're developing our citizens that that is happening um it's you know i mean are we gonna are people supposed to pursue those relationships or not there's a lot of oh Chris D'Elia didn't do anything that bad. He never actually met up with any of those girls. I don't know if that's true. Sorry. I've heard people say stuff like that. Um, but also, you know, you got to know better. You got up an article. You got to know if you have a platform. Um, North American Man Boy Love Association. That's what they're <laughs> called. That's hilarious. Um, but if you have a platform and you 
even want to tell a girl that she's pretty in a DM, and maybe this is a learning curve with social media, but I don't know. I would make sure that that girl was of age. Yeah. I it's call me crazy, call me old fashioned, <laughs> call me I'm such a prude or something, but I don't think that's that hard. Yeah. I have a hard candy. You're oh, you're eating a candy? I'm sorry. And distract and I have to I have to narrow my focus. Um I'm gonna have to finish it before I keep talking. No, 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 you're doing great. Are are we still talking about this issue? We can move on if you want. I think you hit everything. Well, I didn't mean to, you know. They should play. I mean, you just nailed it. Oh, wow. Look at this. What happened? Oh, you're going to pull up Cyberpunk 20. No. <laughs> <laughs> Though that has been so much of my my life. Jake is so good at this game, folks. Yeah, it's new. It's new to me. Joe, come sit here for a second and... um. And talk while I run to the bathroom. What Jake is trying to say. <laughs> We're live. Keep talking. I know. I'm here. So, <clears throat> when you're making a Jimmy Dean breakfast burrito, it's really important that you follow these steps. I prefer the one with the cheddar, and it's it's kind of a cheddar with with um, uh, sausage and egg and what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to pull it out of the freezer and let it you just let it sit it's not going to be totally unfrozen let it sit for about five minutes and preheat your oven to 320 specifically and you you want to microwave you want to microwave the burrito for 30 seconds just to get the outside fully dethawed put it back in the oven for 10 minutes exactly, and then finish it off in the microwave for 45 seconds. What are you talking about? How to make Jimmy Dean. Which one? You wrap it in a wet paper towel? No. You have to follow the instructions I just said. Oh, you had, okay. So Jimmy Dean breakfast burrito. You know what I was trying to do there in OBS. Guys, we, if you're noticing, we're live uh, again for the first time since I got my new machine. And uh, I think we've integrated things in a way that's going to be really great for the future of the show. We can live stream all sorts of things down here, um, but I need to get like a like a potty break overlay for OBS so that we can because I have ones for like oh stream is coming back soon, but I need to make a custom one that explains that I had to go to the bathroom. That has to be a cartoon of you like with a raisinets, you know? Like the... I mean, it's been thirty eight minutes. I've had probably six diet cokes today. That was my fault. I I had a bunch it. of Lacroix. I've been eating a lot of Lion's Choice lately. <sighs> Did you have any Lion's Choice lately, Joe? What'd you have today? I had Jimmy John's, unfortunately. I had to go see the shark fucker. Joy is down. Oh, local spot. South Grand. You had the, there's a Grand location? Not South Grand. I'm sorry. It's, it's but it's on, downtown. It's probably not downtown. Oh, there's a downtown location. What I'm saying is the, the one near me is an uptown location. So near I you? I, there's one in Creve Core. Joya's, I had the roast beef and salami, mustard, mayonnaise with uh, lettuce, mm. and um, I really like the Provel cheese. Oh, yeah. On a wheat toasted They bun. do a red hot riplet salami sometimes. Oh, yeah, it's really good. I get that. Um, it's, yeah. a, it's like a sausage. Fuck. That one's crazy. Joe, I figured something out recently that I wanted to talk about on the show. Awesome. I didn't know we'd spend so much time on um, pedophilia. I have a feeling it's going to be about Netflix. Uh, Netflix is a stock scheme. So the way the stock market is supposed to work, I think, is that when your company gets to, I I know where you're going. to a certain size, you um, start offering public shares. You start offering ownership shares of your company. And what happens is that becomes the capital that you use to grow your company. And your investors will collect on the dividends, dividends and the and the gains of when stock in your company increases in value. Now, now here's the thing. Typically, if a company consistently doesn't make any money, their stock price would go down. Go down. But play, companies like Netflix and Uber, 
have never posted gains or profits or whatever the whatever the term is, but their stock value keeps rising and they keep ringing in more um, dollars. Dollars, and I think it's like this new way of playing that system to where we can continue to um, collect wealth uh, and we're going to invest in content and we can write all those off as expenses. And then, you know, the people that need to get paid, get paid. And it doesn't matter if the bottom line is in the negative or not, because there's always going to be the stock money coming in. Does that make sense? I have something to add. Yeah, please. I think, you know, I don't know the number of notifications I get about here's what's going to be on Netflix next month. Because I'm seeing it. It's on CNN articles at this point. I'm like, what is this? This is my on? thing. This is the death of the real. Right. I think it was Descartes or somebody who talked about this uh, back in, you know, the back in, when psychology was, you know, Dubois? Oh, whoever. Hey. And so um, it's <clears throat> a it's a consp- like it's the death of the real. Nothing is new everything is a reboot uh, it's a it's jumanji it's yeah. fast and the furious nine we're going to space well what i'm saying is is that it's a great system for the stock market because what it does is it gets oh shit they're gonna finally put all the indiana jones on netflix i better go buy some netflix stock and it's so beautiful because they and, really like, they don't lost pay something. anything they lost like a show that was really important to office something the like office. that or maybe it's happened a couple times and then they keep going up and they're offering their own more of their own content, a lot of which I love, but a lot of it's also like it's starting to become like the Lifetime channel. Well, where it's like, so beautiful because they don't have to make anything new. I'm like, I'm they like, can just wow. buy stuff, especially yeah. when, you're, when you're talking about indie films and documentaries. There's millions of them just sitting on millions sh- sitting on shelves that never got bought. So how I think that industry works is you make something. And if you make it independently, you completely fund the whole project. You make a completed thing and you sell the completed thing to a studio or somebody who's going to put it out. Um, You can also work with a studio where they pay for everything along the way, but then they have say on everything along the way. But if I wanted to start a streaming platform, first thing I'm going to do is just grab every half-baked documentary about anything, edit it up, pay for some music to make it sound really good, and blurt that shit out there. Right. Well, but even just with big movies, like they're they're just like they ne- it'd be like if if Apple and Apple's in on it now with Apple TV, but it'd be like if Apple was just like and next week we've got the Razer phone. We're bringing it back and if you subscribe to it, so you get a Razer phone. That was Motorola. And then and then we're going to take it away. And I and I'm just like they're not even making that innovating thing. And anything. I noticed this when Adobe switched from, "Oh, I own Adobe Office 8 or whatever it was called, what Adobe fucking CC, whatever the thing is. Um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> and you pay for it and you would own it forever. Right. Uh, and eventually you would get updated out of it. Like with Pro Tools was the same way. You would get updated out of it. So you'd have to buy the next one. Now it's a subscription. I pay like $8 a month for Pro Tools. And now I always have it as long as I'm still subscribed. Right. And this is part of the new economy is removing ownership of everything and moving it into a Uh-oh. like a subscription base. <laughs> I love the I love the incense. You just got to just because of the, you know, these fucking cats. So Adobe is like that now. I mean, um, I have Postmates like that. I don't pay for the actual delivery on the post share economy, I think is what it's called. But it's a subscription based. Everything is like a. I mean, why wouldn't they just start doing that with clothes? Subscribe. They'll to drop life. off clean clothes. You leave the dirty clothes on your front porch. You pay a hundred bucks a month. You got clothes to wear. There is an like, explanation for that. I've, I've I learned about it. I don't remember what it was. For what? For why they don't have the clothes subscription service. Oh no! I mean, that's just a ter- especially during a pandemic. I'm not wearing fucking service porch <laughs> clothes. But <laughs> what? I'm not wearing like you know what I mean. Like there's like the uh, um what is it um service no centos or something the people that drop off the uniforms and they like clean janitors uniforms and shit so i mean there's so that's a thing but i'm just saying like everything could become subscription based like that do you remember that that's what i don't this is shitty but i that that's what that tim dylan interview was all about with whitney and you know whitney webb yeah oh god i love whitney webb she was talking about how they popularize um non-privacy by creating a share economy and and if you think about it that's what college is already doing you have these kids who are just like so happy to be you know in kind they're in this you know they're in like you know university housing and like they all it's like like if you if harvard university put 
security cameras in their rooms, people would still go. Like, you know, it'd be like in their dorm room. People would be like, yeah, but <laughs> like this is what the rich people are doing, you know. Well, and it's like the um, South Park about cable. You know, it's about what are you going to do? You're going to leave? <laughs> yeah, right. Are you going to not go to Harvard because there's a camera in the bottom of your toilet? Mm-hmm. Like, is that like because I want to like it's what are you going to there's still people that will go. There's still people that will spend 70 grand a year going to Harvard or Yale because they want to go to Harvard or Yale. They don't care. Um, some people will do it no matter what. Yeah. Right. And that's exactly what, you know, why AT&T sucks so bad. It's because like, what are you going to do? It's us or like one other place. And you don't like them because they used to suck. So good luck. You know what I mean? Yeah. Good luck. I mean, you used to be able to. Um, my mom used to always call and bitch about something with the AT and T to keep her bill down. And you can't. You can't even get somebody on the phone anymore. Which is, you know, I'm not well, advocating for that old lady shit. But she, I'm also like, um, she was. What she was telling us was that, um, <clears throat> you should be most concerned when things start to become free, because then. Because realize- they're getting something. They're yeah. not give, actually giving you that for yeah. free. If it doesn't cost you anything to get the individual thing, it's because you've already paid for it in some way. And think about how much data they can harvest from knowing your preferences. Well, they don't even... That's what we talked about. The, the metadata network is this constant living thing. Which is what Uber's going to where, do. To where they don't need to be watching you. There's no NSA person at a computer watching your file all the time. They just have access to all of your information when they need it. They could spend a couple minutes and say, oh, uh, Jake was at Starbucks this morning, and then... He, he really likes this one scene in The Irishman. He rewatches <laughs> the first 20 minutes of The Irishman over Every and over day. again. He's never even finished the whole thing. I mean, they can create FBI profiles for all sorts of things. Yeah. Um, character behaviors. If you have all this metadata... It's insane. You can tell that when I'm on the toilet because it's when I'm on TikTok or something. You know right. what I mean? They have. I mean, and when I say they, the data is available. That's the thing. That's what they're selling. Yeah, and I'm not saying it's the government, like the whole government's it's in the on it. Government, but it already exists. That that technology, that level of surveillance, is already legal and it already exists, right? Yeah. What were you gonna say about that? Um, I was just. I'm sorry. I kept trying to interrupt you. I'm no, sorry. no, you're great. Um, I was talking about how. Yeah, I was just reiterating the idea that Uber, like, you know, you have these restaurants that are, you know, you come to us, we'll pay for your Uber. That's the micro, that's the macro form of what we're talking about. It's that these companies are paying to get to you. And so, like, eventually, I believe, eventually, absolutely, Uber will become free. Because think about how much information they have of you just just by knowing where you want to go. Well, and one thing I really love about, like... The old school version of this is a bar. Well, we live in St. Louis, so we have the St. Louis baseball stadium, right? Bush Stadium. Um, and we have this whole economy built around our baseball experience, right? Here in town, being a, a big deal. Thank you. I've always wanted a Werther's original. Is that what that is? Mm-hmm. Oh, my God, it is. Um, and so a bar, like the Shamrock, one of my favorite bars that sometimes isn't even open, Um will shuttle you to the game for free because they know that you're going to spend money on drinks there before and after. Back in the day, my people used to always tell me you would go to happy hour and there would just be free food or like the tapas tradition of Spain that kind of blew up here like 10 or 15 years ago is, you know, you get a, a free little appetizer every time you order a drink. So you're really making money on the drinks and the food is just uh have a hot dog. Shut up. You know what I mean? Yeah. Now or peanuts or popcorn. So they will start giving us things for free. If we surrender things to them that are valuable, even if it's not currency, like I'm not paying the government, whoever, whatever organization it is, whatever thing it is, whatever detail it is, I'm not paying somebody um, in cash for something they're going to give me. So it makes it feel like it's free, but I'm giving them some kind of commodity. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. And it's amazing right now because they already have us like, like Spotify has us paying for the subscription service and they're taking our data and they're selling it. They have all this income and we don't get a lick of it. The basic version of Hulu, there's still a bunch of ads. So I'm giving you $12 a month to watch ads. And then I think now we have the premium, which is like, 20 bucks a month or something which is probably i don't know well that's knows. like cable i mean cable wouldn't but that's the thing now it's also watch. that's the thing too is now it's just like cable you're i mean eventually they're gonna find a way to monetize every 
checkpoint um because they're not going to they have the money to in, to innovate also it's not like chipotle just rose up and took out fast food for a couple of years somebody built up this fast casual concept and sold it to mcdonald's you know what i mean mcdonald's decided hey you God want love you want fast casual you're tired of the drive through you want a fucking burrito you want to tell me what's in it you want to do the subway of burritos fine mcdonald's is still going to make that money they're not not going to join that fight yeah i'm sure oil people invest in non-oil things because they want to be a part of that transition i would if i was them you're not hearing you're not hearing all of my chewing are you i'm sorry for what? I have all these snacks in my backpack. And what are you? Quit eating. I'm sorry. I'm done. Have you not eaten? I'm done. You I'm, had joyous. I did. I was. We just I'm heard so about joyous. Full. It's so much food when they give it. I mean, have you? Had I thought all today. I thought this next part we're going to get to is all we were going to talk about today. I'm so glad that this podcast is a living thing. Um. Oh no. My my mom just got vaccinated for COVID. I'm definitely not an anti-vaxxer. I'm diabetic, so I get a flu shot every year. I also had the Hep A vaccine when I was in high school, or maybe it was B, whichever one you need to work in food service. When I was first starting Both. college, we had our parents' day, and they were talking to us about the health services on campus, and they were mentioning how they could offer all sorts of immunizations and vaccines at the health center at the university. And my mom passed me a note that said, you could be one less. You know, like the, remember those commercials for the HPV? <laughs> Uh, one less but that doesn't mean i'm not concerned about this new vaccine right it's an mrna vaccine they call it which is sort of a revolutionary technology to say the least it's not just a basic flu shot Uh uh-oh you know it's state-of-the-art sort of technology which makes sense because it's a state-of-the-art problem right so that's all good um my mom's a nurse so she's on the front lines but her job wouldn't give her the vaccine until she had scheduled to have two consecutive days off afterward. Uh-oh. Are you listening? I'm listening. Like, they wouldn't give her the vaccine until they knew she could just sit on her ass for two days. Wait. Wait. They, uh, the, I knew you weren't hearing me. They, no, but what are you implying? You're implying that... They knew see, she was going to be fucked up for a couple of days. Right, which is what the flu shot does. I've never been fucked up from a flu shot, ever. I, it's supposed to give you the flu. It doesn't. Yeah, I mean... But it okay. protects me from the flu. I'm supposed to know this. I'm supposed to be because it's supposed it. to be a compromised version of the flu. Oh, the new. Oh, the new. No, 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 no. Well, here's the thing. Um, that's the flu shot. My experience. I've never had. And that's so this is my hesitation. This is what we call vaccination hesitancy. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but like what? I have to plan a 48 hour blackout after my vaccine to not get sick. Like that's the trade off. Like I need to be guaranteed looseless. You looseless. I need to be guaranteed useless, like for longer than Britney Spears' first marriage in order to get the vaccine. <laughs> Do you remember when she got married in Vegas and they immediately got it annulled as soon as they sobered up? Like, I have to be sick for longer than that yeah. to prevent myself from getting sick. Getting sick in a way that Donald Trump kicked in four days. I well, mean, he's a 75 year old man who eats McDonald's every day. Yeah. He had COVID for four days. Meanwhile, I have to take two days off work. Narcissism is the cure. But anyway, it's in the Adderall, maybe, and maybe <laughs> yeah. the the Remdesivir. He's is he taking is he taking this? <laughs> Everyone is, says he's on Adderall all the time. He's not. No, we don't. Know. I don't know. I think we that would be know. weird because you think he'd be a little ate up. But if he's wearing dentures, I don't know if those are dentures. Yeah, I mean, yes, yeah, so the grinding teeth grinding is what you're implying. Well, just because meth makes your teeth fall out. Oh, yeah. obviously, I'm plugged into the grid. I made a conscious choice to participate in a more conventional life structure in order to maintain my creature comforts and the privilege to work on my actual happiness. So I'm not actually in a bunker, right? Like I'm not hoarding food or musicians, um, munitions, um, cardboard. Maybe I hoard a little bit. We got rid of some of that today. But like, yeah, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not, a I'm not a paranoid guy. Like, I have health insurance, and I own a car, and I pay a mortgage, and I um uh. He doesn't even have tinted windows. I use social media. I have an iPhone. Like, so I'm not acting. I eat a McDonald's. Sorry, sue me. Um, so I'm not acting like uh, I'm not going to get the vaccine if my doctor in his office tell me to. But I raise an eyebrow when. You know, in one news segment, I'm supposed to put my faith in the words of these leaders about a revolutionary emergency vaccine while they also fight for months to ultimately send me six hundred dollars in a Christmas card, like a (laughs) like a rich but kind of hands off 
You should bitch about that for a minute. Relative. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm so, I'll, okay, so, oh, Bernie, thank you so much, Mr. Sanders, for getting the vaccine. Now I feel safe. I'll go do it. Meanwhile, that motherfucker is still a senator. Where's my fucking money, Bernie? Where's my, where's my uh, money, everybody? Anybody, really? anybody in there? Better have my where's money. My, and then Donald Trump was acting like he wanted $2,000 per citizen, which I was like, now we're talking, baby. Right. <laughs> Daddy Trump. But no. then the next day, he signed the $600 thing. Donald, yeah. what happened? I don't like this. He was Here just on Twitter demanding $2,000. <laughs> he was on TV tripling down on maybe the administration will be me. But then the next day he's signing it. What happened? I just want you to know that I disagree with what's happening here. <laughs> well, that's, he was saying, he was saying, I demand $2,000 per citizen, $4,000 for married couples. And a flu shot in my ass. I think, why are we both big ants when we do Trump? <laughs> Everyone gets a vaccine right in their ass. <laughs> I'm big Ange. <laughs> I love, I love, I miss her. God rest her. No. <laughs> God rest her. Uh, so meanwhile, we know the same people, the same government, the same organizations, and a lot of the time, the same actual fucking people, because they never die or leave office, have all been responsible for these terrible abuses of power and str power, 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 <laughs> abuses of power and systematic targeted malicious attacks on innocent civilians. Like take your pick MK ultra proven declassified yeah. really happened. Tuskegee. They really truly gave those dudes syphilis. Yeah. And it oh came gosh. out later that, yeah, we wanted to study what would happen if you didn't um, treat syphilis. What would it do to you? And so they, secretly gave these military dudes fucking syphilis, right? And that's all come out it because just... all those people are no longer in power. A lot of them are dead. Yeah. So, you know, now we can declassify it. Oh, that's terrible. Thank God we don't do that anymore. It was a different time. Ellen. I'm praying. <laughs> they let Ellen run a fucking sweatshop torture chamber in the back of her show. She's a CIA operative. I don't understand what's going on. Yeah, and meanwhile, they send us $600 after months of no direct aid. And oh, by the way, bend over. Here's your needle. Like, yeah, <laughs> it's just that they act like we're crazy. They act like we're crazy for being upset. Yeah. Just because it's happening to all of us doesn't mean it doesn't suck. Yeah. You know what I mean? You guys are just so over. You guys, listen, we're trying to go to the moon <laughs> yeah. that we're trying to merge. <laughs> this is crazy. You guys just need to sit down. And I'll be the first I'll be the first one to tell you. I'll be the first one to tell you to stop living in the past. We got to worry about now. I don't even like shit from January because it was a different world then. Yeah. But I've watched the establishment lie to my face in my lifetime. I was 10 or 12 or 15 and people like Cheney and Rumsfeld were collectively profiting billions of dollars on a oh. fake war, oh. a fake mail bomb with anthrax. They had their new mail bomb scare. It's not a mail bomb anymore. It's anthrax now. <clears throat> and even other alleged pandemics like swine flu when Bush was in office, bird flu when Obama was in office, which thankfully not, never got to the point that this has. Yeah. And that's just one example. I'm thinking of Donald Rumsfeld making $5 million or something on Tamiflu when he had a hand in promoting the stockpiling of it in preparation for swine flu. Like he was part of the, the uh, administration at the time in such a way that he had foreknowledge that, hey, there is this swine flu thing. Um, one way we could prevent... Um, that becoming more of an issue is by stockpiling this drug that is good for this kind of infection. And he just so happened to do a little insider trading and invest in, in old girl while that was happening. Right. That actually happened. It's not a secret because it wasn't even really illegal. Yeah. I think most money that's made on wall street is from this exact instance. It's from people promoting drugs that, you know, and creating a scare and creating and look that up. I, I, you know, so I can be hyperbolic. Some of those numbers, I <laughs> scream a lot of this into my phone while I'm driving around with my dogs. It's not going to come up as the most traded Wall Street thing, but it's going to come up as big pharma and how it works on Wall Street. It's a, it's, a, it's a proof. I mean, this is just what happens. It's not. I, I, I don't feel the need to look at. And let's this. look at what the establishment 
is currently working on for us. It's like I said about the universe or the simulation we live in last week. They are totally trolling us and not even trying to pretend anymore. The universe is just throwing random details back in my face out of contact, out of context to link everything together in a way that makes me feel crazy. Yeah. And the government establishment or whatever you want to call them with the smaller and smaller group of people all the time who refuse to die are parading Joe Biden in the white house. He doesn't even know if he wants to be president years ago. He, you know, he, he backed out and he, he <sighs> said, let Hillary do it. Oh my gosh. You're stressing me out. <laughs> he was still kind of sweet then. He wasn't that weird. Yeah. And I've been reading about these political simulations uh, of the, that, you know, these academics or whatever these organizations have in an election Wait, year like to, to plan for this stuff. No, no, no. These, um, these simulations, these political simulations are, um, like a mock trial. Yeah. 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 They're these games that, that political organizations or research organizations or universities, you know, put on in an election year to plan for the different scenarios so they can advise people that care, you know, um, mm -hmm. board members of Fortune 500 companies or, you know, uh, the CIA or whoever mm -hmm. uh, pretty much Biden is going in on inauguration day uh, in one way or another is what it looks like from here. And they're not hiding that they don't, you know, they don't um, that's who they want in. And even when the DNC, for example, screwed Bernie for Hillary, it felt like the whole thing was set up and it was just this big Hillary takeover uh, and nothing against her. Particularly I voted for, you know, begrudgingly, at least then it still felt cloak and dagger. You know, there was that girl at the DNC with the hair that they outed and it was still nuanced and secretive. You know what I mean? But these girls out here, honey, ain't even trying to play. They don't care if you know them. They don't care if you see what they doing and they got the little plan and they're sticking to it. And it's, they don't really, they're not trying to be sneaky anymore. They're saying here, fucking take your, take your shit. Uh, what do we, what do we like, Joe? Here's your little Postmates. Here's your little $600. Yeah. We'll call choice. you later. We're yeah. working on some stuff. Um, go ahead and just get that vaccine. Yeah. We're going to make the oldest among us get injected with something on camera. Yeah. Not even saying that it wasn't the vaccine, but like, what is that supposed to do for me? You know what I mean? That does, did that make you feel better? No. Joe, are you going to get the vaccine? Again, I said. Yeah. Again. Yeah, I'll get it. Yeah. I'm. If my doctor and their team tell me to get it, I never really got flu shots as an adult until they started telling me to. I already say I got it at my job. So you're lying? Yeah. I'm, 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 well, I'm what you might call a liar. And I just, people look at me and they say, well, have you gotten the vaccine? I'm like, yeah. And they're like, well, I'm like, yep. <laughs> well, How good do, can you prove? Nope. Well, well, that's yeah. going to be a whole thing people are worried about. I cannot wait. I cannot wait to get out my driver's license. Dead rhinos only charge in a mudslide. <laughs> oh, no. Did Mufasa die? Dead rhinos only charge in a mudslide. That was in my time hop from Twitter a couple years ago, and I guess I tweeted it. I can't find evidence of it as a quote anywhere else on the internet. It's like a fortune cookie from my past self. And uh, <laughs> That's a good one. But I'm sort of exploring what freedom means to me. I define my liberty every day in the decisions I make. Um, currently, my freedom includes an annual flu shot, a day job with state-sponsored organization with premium benefits and pretty decent hours, a home, a car, but also art and a lot of free speech. Um, my liberty excludes things that I don't like, like Chick-fil-A and Walmart. I happen to be a Sam's Club member through my father's business, but I don't participate in the Walmart side of their business really at all. It's just not an experience that I've enjoyed. Can you explain that, please? Yeah, I don't have a big I don't have a big thing like, oh, Walmart does this specific thing that makes me mad. I just I prefer other stores. And lately, I don't really shop anywhere except for on my phone because of the pandemic. So um, I just choose not to participate in, in, in one. They just stress me out when I have to go in one. I don't like it. It's not like the stores that I'm used to. And um, and they're just a big part of the problem. Like it just doesn't, I can't enjoy it. It's like, I don't, I still have not eaten a Chick-fil-A. Now, Jake. I've eaten Chick-fil-A twice, paid <laughs> for it once. And this was like seven years ago. And uh they just opened one of the first brick and mortar locations locally. And my girlfriend at the time, my wife now wanted uh, their grilled nuggets. Cause she was on paleo and she could eat those. Oh, so good. I bet they're good. I, I bet they're good. 
I mean, they're bet they're good. I, I mean, they're just, they're just I bet these the rubbery... cake at Marie Antoinette's Last Supper was delicious. Is that your joke? What? <laughs> that one right there, Marie Antoinette. I just, just shooting from the hip. You just shot it from the dick. Huh? From the hip dick. I love that. That's good. But no, I mean, I'm sure the food is good at the top, but you have to be able to enjoy your meal without people banging on the door to take their stuff back. Yeah. You know what I mean? You have to make sure that you can build happiness and joy and even luxury for yourself in a way that's not um, directly connected to the people that are going to get mad at you. Like, I don't understand what people think it like me flexing with my Starbucks on Instagram is one thing, but when you, you are just letting everyone know that you took your whole family on a million dollar vacation for your 40th birthday during a pandemic where people can't, go visit their grandmother while she's dying in the hospital. I wish we would disenfranchise those people. We just can't. That's what I'm saying. We just can't help it. Cause they, they have us thinking that we could be them. Yeah. They let enough of us become them. And they really love talking about, Oh, you know, Oprah was a prostitute in Baltimore when she was a teenager. And what? Yeah. Oh, there. I mean, look that up. I'm looking it up. That's not, that's, that's, I learned that from Oprah. And who, is her, who is her pimp? I didn't ask her. Matt Lauer? I didn't. You know what? That's not funny. I'm sorry. Because <laughs> so, it is so funny. No, it is yeah. so funny. No, it just came up. No, as... but that's what I'm saying is they want to show you rags to riches all the time. There used to be a show on VH1 called that. And they want to they promote that because they want you to think that you are one Powerball ticket away from being out of that trailer park and on Rodeo Boulevard. They want you to think that. And the <laughs> option is so american and and i want you to have that freedom to pursue whatever you want to pursue liberty and, and to hit all the green lights at the right time i want you to be able to do that but we can't keep acting like 7 billion people on this planet have that potential they're not all starting with the same thing yeah they're not all starting with the same it's like you know it's some schools talk about we can't assume that kids can do homework online at home because we can't assume that they all have stable internet connections at home, which seems crazy to think about as a mainstream middle-class person in 2020, but it's very real. We have dozens of hotspots we've sent home to our students. That's really cool. Because we want them to have access to the stuff that they, they need oh. while they're, and it's not a perfect technology and there's a lot of throttling and a lot of limitations and it's not perfect, but that's the reality. So, there is a standard of living and a lot of people live below that standard. That's why it's the standard. Cause it's like a C plus at best. Right. Uh, Did you know I was this good? Yeah, no, I didn't. You're so smooth. So that's pretty detailed and pretty picky and choosy, but your definition of freedom should be that detailed. Even if it is just to take pride and joy in your choices. Absolutely. I chose to buy a Ford escape in 2014. I could have bought anything. It wasn't even new. It was pre-owned, a model year old. My grandfather worked for Ford for decades, and my buddies were selling Fords at the time. And looking at all my options, I took pride in going that way at that time. Now, lately, since, conveniently since my warranty expired, you know, I've had temptations about uh, maybe wishing I had a different car. Don't but you but at the time that I made that decision, it was perfect. It's like when you buy a guitar and you know it's the right place at the right time, and it's like, oh, I gotta get this. This is this the planets aligned for me to have this experience. And maybe you have that with a sweater or whatever. People still wear sweaters. You are the kids wearing sweaters? I'm wearing a sweater right now. Okay, good. Thank you, Joe. I just want people to find that for themselves. Give yourself that gift. Demand that the choices in your life make you proud of what you're doing. And if all you have is a room in someone else's house, you can take pride in how you choose to keep that space. And, and I'm not saying that to be like clean your room. I'm saying that to like um, treat yourself well, because no, I mean, I don't know that anyone else is going to give you those things. Yeah. And, you know, uh, I just want you to do it for you. I want you to carve out your own little square of pride and joy. That's what this room is down here for me. And I've been kind of working on this all week, kind of all since this show started several, mm. several months ago. This has been a, a process to, you know, get this space in a way that we could do this show exactly the way we're kind of doing it. We have Pro Tools on my Mac. We have <laughs> OBS on my new PC rig, which is just crazy and I'm just uh, in love with. Um, 
that's an extreme tangible way that I do that. But I also take pride in just waking up and seeing my puppies and my wife and my cats and just knowing that, oh, I have a, I have a family here, you know, and I could have a bigger house. My cats could be cleaner. That's a really good take, Jake. I've, that was probably, that's probably the quote of your life right there. Oh, Jesus. Don't be uh, stingy about your definition Don't be of stingy. Be very specific about your definition of freedom. I think that's probably the most American thing that's ever been said. Okay. Is, is don't be, what'd you say? <laughs> we'll have I mean, that's audio. your dragon, and her yeah. name is Freedom. Yeah. And that's who we're chasing. Also, reaffirming that for yourself each and every day is your daily fight to keep it alive, right? Right. You, you wear your favorite clothes. Right, that's the analogy. Is you wear your favorite clothes. If you have a favorite shirt, you're wearing it. That Ozzy Osbourne t-shirt that's on Tina, my mannequin back there. Mm -hmm. It's a good one. I mean, I used to wear that every other day. I would wear it. I'd go home and wash it. And it would take about a day to work its way through the cycle. And I'd wear it the very next day. So I tried to wear it Monday, Wednesday, Friday. That's so sweet. I didn't know. Because I love that shirt. When I was in seventh grade, that was my favorite shirt. And I only quit wearing it so that I could so that I could keep it. Because I had a really cool white stripes t-shirt that I wore and wore and wore until the armpits literally like fucking rotted out. There were big holes where my armpits were. It's like it's like it's a caricature or, or a memorial of your former self reminding it's, you. Yeah, of who that's you are. a yeah, it's like how Batman puts the bat suit on a mannequin, except that's like my former Right. My former self with my Halloween mask and my zebra tights. We need like a piece of plexiglass on top so you can look into it in the reflection and see yourself on the head of the man. Oh, yeah. Like in, yeah, like in Dawn of Justice. That yeah. was lit. And you'd be like, oh, yeah, that's who I am as a female model with an Ozzy Osbourne t shirt on. So, like, I, I want people to keep their freedom and their self love like a good jacket. And. By each of us not waiting to get off the ride at some arbitrary finish line, which is a huge problem, that mentality. But maintaining a daily strive, we are replenishing that hope every day. Mm. Every day I'm working to be a little bit healthier. I'm working to be a little bit more productive. I'm working to be... Um, That's right. Uh, what? It's like Amen. A, it's like you're a preacher. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Glory. All right. Glory. All right. Ah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but that's the thing is that, like, for example, my mom works with a really devout Muslim woman who absolutely will not skip her scheduled prayers in her day. She's a couple times a day. I think she is scheduled to pray five times a day or seven times a day. She has a couple that are on her shift, and she absolutely has to go at this scheduled time. It's non-negotiable, and no one's making her do that. Better than a smoke break, I, I guess. Well, I, I think that's a great way to look at it, too. But it's her own. She's doing it not because her somebody's going to ask her if she did it. She's doing it because that's how she stays connected with her faith, and it brings balance and structure to her life. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. It's also why it's, she also does it because she fears the Oh, maybe fact, God's going to ask her why well, she didn't do it. I mean, but seriously, we should acknowledge the fact that what she believes is real to her. So if she she believes that if she does if she misses it, she's going to be tortured for a couple of years. That's what the Muslims believe, just so you know. Okay, that's, that's easy, fear. easy, easy, brother. That's I mean, what, no, I'm, that's no, the, I'm, listen, I'm, that's what the Muslims believe. Listen. No, no, I'm telling you, I, this is true. No, but okay, so that's a good point. So that's part of it's her good. faith. No, but it's good that she's There praying. are plenty of people who, um, who believe that same thing ideologically, but also practice more casually than that. No, is all it's I'm trying to that say. they're proud of. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so she's doing that because that's her faith, but it's also because... Like my mom says Hail Marys every time before she goes into work just yeah. to just. To, and I, you know what the most, be one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen is I was waiting for the dim sum place to open at 11 o'clock on Del Mar. Mm -hmm. I was on, no, I was on Olive. Mm -hmm. um, I'm listening. Oh, he's taking a swig. I was, uh, I was the, uh, I was waiting for the dim sum place to open and the, the owner of the store came out and he said some kind of a prayer and he lit a little thing, kind of blew it out and he kind of prayed over the parking lot and then went back in. He was like praying for a successful day of business. Yeah. I, not only is that really beautiful and a great way to celebrate your faith or whatever, but also that's doing, that's playing a role in that person's mm -hmm. life where that's keeping them structured and balanced. And that may be a totally secular thing for you. That may be your coffee in the morning and that may be, um, but don't, that's what I'm saying. Let's say it is your coffee in the morning. Say you have to have one specific coffee beverage, one certain way at the same time every morning. 
don't don't hate your fucking coffee. If you hate your fucking mug, throw it away. Buy four mugs at Target for seven dollars, and you have different mugs. You know what I mean? Like how it took me like a year to buy a new mop. My old mop got gross, and I started to throw parts of it away. And then I was like, "Why? Hey, what is a mop? Thirty bucks? Mm -hmm. Hello." It's important never to forget why. Why make yourself suffer? Because those little right. things, those little comforts may be all you can control. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm but, sorry. Does it make you feel good? It's, yeah, I feel, yeah, I feel something. And it's like the idea that like Christmas spirit breathes life into Santa's sleigh. You know what I mean? Like it's like, you know, the, from Elf when people have to believe so that he can turbo charge his sleigh it says here the messenger of allah said oh, fuck. a person neglecting salat even if he makes it up later which is the prayer he will remain in jahannam for a period of one hubk, which i think is uh, something to be feared anyway we can continue i'm sorry you can cut this out i saw this it? really great um documentary I, I used in a class once i was teaching um world literature maybe and i think so maybe it was juniors and but i had the 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 non-ap section and um there's something we were going to read where the background had to do with like the middle east and uh -oh. i realized that these kids don't know anything about the actual history of that region and i had so many questions about um why is it that you know my whole life that's been such an area of you have the whole, the perpetual holy war happening there you have um all these different conflicts all these other parts of the world fighting proxy wars there sometimes yeah. it seems like it's over resources with oil and um you know lithium that they make lithium ion batteries out of mm -hmm. um and but they're also fighting amongst themselves all the time. And so we watched this really great documentary called like atomic Jihad or something. It was on Amazon prime at the time. And it was really in the weeds. It was really like it was out of a textbook, but it was really great in showing like the entire documented history of that region and where all of those tensions come from. Yeah. And then where, cause it, cause then I got to the point where I thought, Oh, maybe it just started in the seventies or something. Cause I hear, cause I started to learn about stuff all the way back then, but it's really, there's been conflict in that region for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Right. And part of where I was getting down the rabbit hole with some of the other stuff I was researching for this episode today also interplays with this constant Israel versus Palestine kind of a thing. And this general, like um, non-Muslim versus Muslim uh, conflict. That's so um, constant. And like, it plays out in all these different scenarios. I think what you're, I think we, something that I noticed you saying is um, I think what we ignore also is understanding nomadic culture and nomadic culture can be, uh, they, there can be a lot of pride taken in. in um, well, it seems to be the of... issue too, so much in that region that people are refusing to live together. Right. You know what I mean? It's not that people are fighting for um, uh, a place. It's, they're just refusing to. Well, that's what I'm saying is that nomadic culture takes a great deal of pride. Why in is taking... this such a, why our show always comes back? We are going to solve Israel and Palestine on this show at some point. Yes. We're going to do it. I'm just kidding. I'm not, not, this I'm not episode, excited about that. Not this that. episode today, maybe, but I think we get, Joe, we get some of our research game on. I think yeah. I said we get an expert in here. There's a lot of papers on it, but I think there's plenty of experts that want to talk about it. I mean, I say we get them. You should get a whole, like, you know, talking head section. They should all be screaming at each other at once. That would be great. Yeah. And we'll just sit here and nod. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> but this yeah. conversation's not over. It's not over. You know what I mean? I feel like this episode is. Mm -hmm. But I feel like this conversation's not. Because it all started with, I didn't know what a Zionist was. <laughs> <laughs> and, but it's also, when I get deep in the weeds about, these are things that I get really upset about. Like, when I get mad at 
the way the establishment kind of does their their thing um, and just acts like we're supposed to be okay with it. I really reflect on what I was interpreting on the news as a child versus what I understand now as an adult and and how, again, I'm not saying we need to go back and fight about who killed Kennedy. I also have opinions on that if you want to talk about that. But um, we can just stick to the things that have happened in the last 20 years, and there's plenty of proven declassified stuff that um, validates our frustration. Again, just because it's happening to all of us does not mean it's not important. And the way that I'm choosing to respond to that is I continue to vote with my dollar, like we talked about. Mm -hmm. um, and I just try to really lead with like the, the real priorities in my life, really caring yeah. for my family and creating sustained joy in, in, in the environment I Absolutely. leave myself in. Absolutely. And I, and I'm, I'm going to say that I'm going to root for finding a solution, but I think it really gets down to, it's going to, I think it's, it's sad, but the fact of the matter is, is that when it comes to that issue, it really ends up getting down to having to pick a side because it's very, very complicated. I've, I've learned a little bit about it and there was a lot of discussion about it in my college class and there was a lot of discussion about it in high school and I'm, I was raised a Christian. So there's a lot of discussion about it there. It's very, very complicated. I, and, and the only way, and you end up making statements that you don't mean. I'm very worried about that. So it's, it's scary. Well, it's just like the pedophilia issue. Like we had this long yeah. conversation beforehand about exactly what we were curious about and yeah. what we wanted to discuss on camera. Cause I didn't want to just misspeak and say something that seemed awful. Yeah. Right. And You're really good at it. I'm, I'm learning from, you. I'm a really articulate, intuitive gentleman. I mean, I'm a yeah. high functioning, yeah. um, intellectual being like if there was a darwinist scale of higher evolved people and then there was a lesser evolved people you'd be 75 percent of the way up i really wish we'd separate those classes well that's our show <laughs> i really wish we'd separate people based off <laughs> capacity and if we could IQ. just if everyone could just take an iq test and if you don't make the grade brother we're gonna eat you we're gonna <laughs> Is you're that what you're farmers. saying? <laughs> you're gonna be far Put listen, a fence around Listen, them. <laughs> if you're not obviously disabled, <laughs> but your IQ is below a certain number, bacon. Yeah. <laughs> Have you looked up those threads? They're awful. We're making bacon. <laughs> We're making bacon. Uh. Guys, that's another episode of Jacob V Weekly. High five. Follow us wherever you get your podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Podbean, Google, whatever. You can also find original music by Jacob V and Too Deep on all of your music platforms, Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon, Deezer. You can bing it. Exclusively on Bandcamp, you can find music from my old band, Battlestag. I love those guys. It's a, a, a great document of our, our time together. You can follow me on Twitter at Malachi Envy, on Instagram at Jacob Allen V. We are currently live on Twitch, uh, Facebook on my Jacob V Music page, and YouTube simultaneously via Streamlabs OBS Prime, not yet a sponsor. I also curate a monthly playlist since uh, May of 2020. I have one for each month on Spotify. Search for Jacob V's favorite songs, and you'll see them all there. We did it, guys. Be safe.